Hi everyone, uh, my name is Christina Gomez and I am a librarian at Milwaukee Public Library. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for a workshop on small scale composting from home. Um, it's presented in partnership with Groundwork Milwaukee. Um, I want to encourage you to visit the library's website, mpl.org slash stay connected um, to see all of our upcoming virtual library programs. Um, and I want to mention, you know, we're approaching the end of summer, but there is still time to sign up for all of our summer reading programs for children, for teens, and for adults. Um, so I will drop the sign up link into the chat box if you're interested in signing up for those programs by August 31st. Um, in this webinar format, your microphones are muted, your webcams are off, but you can ask questions um, via the question box on your screen. If you're using a tablet or a smartphone, it might appear as a question mark. Um, otherwise, it might actually say question box, but feel free to ask any questions you have. If you're having technical issues, I can help out with those. And then at the end of um, the presentation, we'll have some time for questions for our presenter next. So please feel free to use that. Um, I also want to mention there is a handout available to you in the handouts section of your dashboard. It's the Milwaukee Public Library Director Paula Kiley's statement on race and social equity. Um, and within that document, there are some suggested readings um, for young people and for adults. So I hope you have a chance to look through that and share your response with us. We definitely want to hear from you. Um, but actually, now I'm going to hand it over to Nick, who is the field operations manager at Groundwork Milwaukee. Um, and again, feel free to ask your questions as the presentation goes along. And Nick is going to take some time at the end to, to answer those for you. So thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Christina. Um, thanks so much for giving us an opportunity to uh, lead this workshop. Uh, composting is something that's very important to us, and I'm really excited to uh, kind of show you a few more little things about it and different ways to do it pretty easily at home. Um, so we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, as she mentioned, uh, this is a partnership with Groundwork Milwaukee. Um, we are a nonprofit here in Milwaukee that does a variety of things around food access and food justice. Uh, we help lease uh, vacant lots that the city owns to neighborhood residents. Uh, these residents then use those vacant lots, transform them from just grass uh, to gardens for vegetables, for flowers. Uh, people put art murals and things on them. Uh, we also do a variety of youth programs. Uh, we also run a uh, very small scale farm here in Milwaukee uh, that uh, donates all the produce to local food banks. Um, so that's a little bit about us and what we do. Uh, um, I'm going to kind of just jump right into the compost aspect. Um, and before we get into just how you compost and all the details of it, I just want to spend a quick second talking about why compost matters. Um, and I've got a, kind of got two images here, two problems uh, that I feel like are challenges uh, that the world is facing. One of them is just a large amount of junk and trash and things like that uh, that end up that has somewhere to go. We kind of have a a uh, little bit of a disposable economy. Um, and we do also have financial challenges with landfills that cost taxpayer money. Um, so uh, the EPA says about 28% of what you are throwing out right now could be ended up composted. Um, and that's, you know, 28% less stuff that ends up in a landfill, uh, covered up, hidden away, something like that being a problem. Uh, on the flip side of this, uh, so compost in high quality soil is a really essential part of life, of uh, being able to sustain ourselves on this planet. Um, and uh, farmlands all across the U.S. and in many places, other places as well internationally, are facing a large amount of uh, soil erosion, soil depletion, things like that from traditional agriculture practices that kind of uh, don't really focus on building the quality of soil. They focus more just on pulling out as much as they can. And there's this kind of constant balance. As you pull nutrients out of the soil, you have to put them back in. Um, and the way you do it matters a lot. And using traditional fertilizers and constantly tilling the soil every year, flipping it, flipping it, flipping it. Um, this really uh, depletes the quality of our soil on the planet. Um, 
And so compost is kind of one of the solutions to that, making high quality fertile compost. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the benefits of compost for like soil health and plant health in just a second. Um, the other reason I think composting matters, in my opinion, um, is because all parts of life are inextricably connected. All living things and compost is just an essential part of that life. As things as things grow, things also must decay. And so um, this is just kind of a natural part of that process. Tapping into it um, is a very, very old piece. People have been composting for tens of thousands of years, ever since agriculture ever started. People have known that uh, using dead plants, animal manure, things like that, and letting it break down really improves the quality of the soil. Um, so to me, it's just a really important part of any kind of um, any kind of life. So, um, so some of the benefits that compost provides. Well, the biggest one is you know compost is improving the health of your soil. Um, it does this in a couple different ways. One of the big ones is providing nutrients when plants need them. Um, so rather than like traditional fertilizers, where you add the fertilizer uh, right on the soil. Um, that the majority of that fertilizer washes away. Um, some of it ends up in our water tables. Some folks might have heard about these algae blooms that are in the Gulf of Mexico off of the Mississippi River. Um, so a lot of traditional fertilizers, while they're really high in things like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, really high in nutrients, the majority of those nutrients, the plants can't even get. The majority of that stuff just washes right away. Um, so the difference in compost is while it's kind of a little bit lower in those like NPK numbers, um, it very re slowly releases that um, those nutrients and gives the plants just what they want, just when they need it. Um, separate from uh, providing nutrients for plants, uh, it also helps build soil structure. I don't know if anybody here has a garden uh, and they've kind of maybe watered, tried to pour, do a little bit of watering on their garden on a dry day and this top layer of soil is like cracked and caked and the water kind of just runs right off and doesn't even like penetrate in. Um, some of that can be from poor soil structure and compost can really open it up, create these little aggregates that are right in there um, and kind of allow uh, more moisture to get in, um, more macro, more air to get in as well. Um, the plants and the uh, roots need a little bit of aeration as well. Um, and one of the things I got on here is drought protection. Compost is very well known for uh, having a high moisture uh, retention. So really holding in water, almost like a wet sponge, just constantly holding it. Um, and it helps prevent against drought and things like that as well. Um, and then again, I mentioned uh, high quality soil prevents erosion. So if your soil is, even if it's nut uh, you know, nutrient rich, nutrient dense, but doesn't have good structure, that stuff just washes right out. Um, so the compost helps hold it. And then one of the last ones I want to put in there is uh, compost says there's a lot very well documented that it can neutralize uh, different toxins and different things like that from pollution. Uh, folks are even doing all kinds of different experimental studies for removing heavy metals and such uh, using compost. So the power of compost is very, very, uh, very well known, very well documented. Um, and uh, one last piece of why compost is important. Um, a lot of folks who are gardeners, every year you're harvesting, you're harvesting, you're harvesting, uh, taking out good veggies, good food. Well, you have to be able to put that back in as well. Um, so that's that balance of life and death, growth and decay. Um, so, you know, if you want to have quality food, if you want to have rich uh, nutrients in your vegetables, you have to have nutritious soil as well. The soil is the foundation for all that. So if you have soil that doesn't have nutrients in it, um, then you're not going to have food that has nutrients in it either. So those are just some of the pieces of uh, how compost improves health or soil health. Um, so the two different composting methods uh, that folks might have heard of, uh, these are just the standard types. There's all kinds of different ones, but the main ones are hot composting and cold composting. Um, Cold composting is what most folks are likely going to be doing in their backyards. So I'll touch on that in a second, but I wanted to include hot composting as well. Um, compost is a chemical and a biological kind of process. So it's both 
macro and microorganisms in there chewing, eating away, things like roly polies, worms, stuff like that. And then it's also a chemical reaction as well of uh, different, uh, different nutrients, different elements breaking down. When folks do large compost piles, uh, usually commercial compost piles, things like that, they can really heat up somewhere between 135, 165. That's what you're looking for. They can get all the way up to 180, but that's kind of sometimes bad. Um, so commercial composters, they're kind of letting their compost piles cook. This makes it go a little bit faster. This also kills a bunch of uh, pathogens, kills weeds, seeds, things like that. Um, so hot composting is a great, uh, a great piece for it. Great way to do it. It's a little bit faster. Um, but most homeowners are going to be doing, and most people who are in there trying to compost at home, are going to be doing cold compost, where you add a little bit at a time uh, every week. You kind of let it sit, and things slowly break down. Both these processes work great. Um, the main advantage of hot compost is it's much quicker, um, but usually you have to start with kind of one big batch, let it cook, um, rather than just like adding a little bit slowly, slowly over time. So most of the stuff we're going to be doing is uh, cold composting, kind of right in your own backyard. Um, it might still heat up a little bit, but that's kind of not the main focus. So, uh, so compost materials, what can you compost? Uh, that's one of the big questions everybody always asks. Um, and one of the main things you can compost uh, is pretty much anything that's living uh, or was previously living, um, but there are some things you want to avoid, some things that might not be so good for your compost pile, uh, stuff like that. Um, and so the, the majority of compost materials fall into one of two categories. Um, category one is these green materials I kind of got on the left. That's the stuff most obvious, like fruit and veggie scraps, uh, coffee grounds, tea bags, uh, you know, pumpkins, anything like that that you can see. Um, and uh, also dead plants, weeds. Uh, for example, if you grow a tomato plant and you eat tomatoes, well, you're not eating the, the leaves of the tomato or the stems of the tomato or any of that. So all that just boom, ends up right in the compost pile as well. Uh, pumpkins falls right around the corner. So I put that in there. Eggshells, I also think, are a pretty good material to add in. They add a little bit of calcium, those um, micronutrients. Um, and then here in Wisconsin, one people don't necessarily always think about, but we're here in Wisconsin, so I put it on there. Brewer's mash. Um, I love to even just get a small bucket full of brewer's mash uh, from a, a brewer or a home brewer or something like that. There's so many breweries here in the city of Milwaukee. Um, it's very easy to get at. Um, and so these are the green materials. They're very high in nitrogen, and it's very important to know the difference between the green and the brown materials. We kind of mix these two together in a lasagna, uh, so to speak, um, and that's kind of how you make compost. So the one side is the green materials. Those are higher in nitrogen. Then on the other side, you kind of have your brown materials or your dry materials or uh, your kind of higher carbon materials. Um, and those are things like leaves, sawdust, wood chips, shredded paper. Um, I kind of put a little asterisk there. Um, some papers might have uh, uh, inks that have metals in them from like different colors or dyes or things like that. Although most newspaper comes from a soy-based ink, so that's always good. Uh, straw and hay is a great one. Um, that's a really always a good one, breaks down quick. Um, dryer lint is on there as well. I just want to note that sometimes dryer lint does contain plastic if you have synthetic clothes and things like that. Uh, so that's just one thing to note. Um, green materials, in my opinion, uh, for home composting, you're kind of slowly getting over time. Um, you know, as you make a meal, as you, you know, cook a stew or whatever, you have a fruit, uh, make a salad, um, you're kind of slowly accumulating more and more green materials. Um, brown materials, uh, in my opinion, come in like a big old batch. Like you try and get a big old batch of it. I either get a, you know, a bag of sawdust from somebody you know who does carpentry. Um, you get a pile of wood chips. Um, leaves, personally, I fill up garbage bags with leaves and then I just save them all year round because uh, leaves are one of my favorite. They break down really quick. Um, and then just one last thing I want to say about the two different materials. It's always good to have uh, a diverse mixing of materials. Um, you don't just want like all pumpkins and all leaves. Um, that's not going to make the best compost. So you want a little bit of 
uh, kind of a little bit of a variety uh, for what you got. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a second when we get to layering also. So, um, so there are some materials you want to avoid. Um, they might compost eventually. Uh, they might be bad for your system, things like that. They might have chemicals in them, stuff like that. So on the left, I've got just materials that I would avoid not add in. Top of the list is things like dairy products, oils, greases, fats. Um, those kind of things are really going to attract rodents and attract animals, uh, raccoons, and uh, you know they're going to be really looking for your compost pile, and they don't break down that great either. Um, same thing with meat and bones. Um, some people who do commercial composting will take bones and things like that, but for home composting, uh, it's really you don't want to do it. Uh, the other one I got on there is invasive weeds. Uh, the one I'm really thinking of is like garlic mustard or buckthorn or things like that where um, you might think you're composting it, but you might just be planting it in your garden kind of another three months when you go and put it in. Um, especially if you're not doing, if you're doing cold compost, because cold compost doesn't necessarily kill the weeds seeds uh, like hot compost does. Um, so I try and avoid invasive weeds, general weeds, like just, you know, stuff that's you're pulling out of the garden beds and you're trying to thin out your garden bed. All that stuff I normally would put right into the compost piles, uh, but I avoid the really invasive stuff. And then um, thick branches or sticks, you can compost some, and they just take a long time, uh, like more than a year to break down. Uh, charcoal ash, again, is not recommended, and pesticide treated material, things like that have chemicals in them. Uh, cat and dog feces, I would not, again, uh, recommend composting, um, especially not in cold compost because you're not killing the pathogens that could possibly be in there. And then one more, I mentioned sawdust just a minute ago. Uh, one thing to note is you can't just use any sawdust. You want to try and use clean sawdust. Um, so stuff that's like pressure treated or green, that has chemicals in it to prevent it from rotting. Um, and that's not good for your soil and things like plywood or OSB, that stuff has glue in it um, and you want to avoid it. So, And then on the right here, I got some materials um, that you can use, um, but you should just know that they can affect the pH of your uh, compost bin um, and kind of make it a little bit more acidic. And that makes it a little bit harder for some of the microorganisms and macroorganisms to do their thing, chew in and kind of break down the stuff. So you can add wood ash, pine leaf, citrus, oak leaves. You just don't want to add a huge amount of them. You want to kind of add them sparingly and uh, things like that. So those are the materials. Again, I just want to go back real quick, green versus brown. Um, those are the two main categories um, of the different materials. And then, um, so this is kind of the recipe. You got the majority of what you're composting are these brown high carbon materials, uh, the sawdust, the leaves, the uh, wood chips, shredded paper, stuff like that. Oh, that's the main thing that you're breaking down. And then you use a small amount of this uh, green uh, green material high in nitrogen, um, that's the food scraps, veggies, coffee grounds, all sorts of stuff like that. And so you kind of want to do a 70 to 30 ratio um, by weight. Uh, that being said, nobody is really out there with a scale uh, measuring every single pound and that kind of thing. Um, folks kind of just do the best they can to eyeball it a little bit, um, but err on the side of having more of this brown carbon material um, and I, at the end, I also have some problem solving stuff for you um, about, uh, you know, how to tell if you got too much of one or too much of the other or things like that. So, and then another little note, uh, just right at the bottom. So these are two of the ingredients that um, compost needs is carbon, nitrogen materials or brown and green materials. Uh, the other two uh, things that compost needs are oxygen and water. Um, so. Uh, the air is kind of all around you as long as it's not getting compacted and really tight. Um, but you sometimes need to add moisture or water uh, to your compost bin. Your ideal compost bin is kind of just, if you can imagine a sponge and you squeeze a wet sponge and like only one drop of water comes out. Um, it's just kind of just moist enough um, where it's kind of holding water, but not so moist that it's like sloppy wet. Um, air can't get in then if it's too moist and it can kind of start going anaerobic or uh, where it won't smell good. So that's kind of the super basic compost recipe, 70% brown, 30% green, 
Um, folks can get more specific if, you know, some people make special composts for different plants or that kind of thing. Um, but I kind of want to keep it basic for uh, what we're doing today. Um, and so this is kind of uh, how that, what that recipe actually ends up looking like. And this is that lasagna that I was talking about um, with the brown and the green and things like that. Um, and the reason you want to have so much brown and really kind of layer it in this way with the the green being totally buried and not quite reaching the edges is this really helps deal with pests rodents things like that as long as the food scraps are really well covered and kind of really buried in there um kind of as you build up your layer um then you know uh they can't really get at it and so generally when folks are starting compost piles you're not starting with this whole image right here you start all the way at the bottom and you kind of make your brown layer first and also kind of note they put this stocky material or all the way at the bottom uh, you want to try and put like thicker pieces of the brown material things like sticks or wood chips stuff like that what you don't want to do is put stuff like leaves or paper all the way at the bottom because that stuff really compacts really doesn't get air in there with all the weight on top so you want to put your bigger carbon materials all the way at the bottom um, so you kind of start out with a little bit of it and then you add as you get kitchen scraps you know you keep them in your house or you keep them in a bucket whatever you do you add them at the end of the week add a little bit and then you kind of add another layer of the brown and that's kind of why i was saying it's good to have um, a bunch of extra of the brown material kind of just sitting on the side waiting to get used uh, because you're kind of slowly adding that green layer every week every week adding a little bit more of the uh, the green nitrogen rich material. So, and I'll just run back real quick, one second to the green and brown material piece again, uh, make sure folks get it. Um, green materials are those kind of more wet veggie scraps, brown materials are the more dry um, kind of paper, carbon, carbon materials. So. so that's the layering, that's the lasagna. Um, <laughs> People got lots of jokes about uh, different layers and different methods. Um, the next part I wanted to show is just different types of compost bins. There's a million different kinds of, uh, of bins out there. Uh, there's kind of two different ones we got here. Uh, the plastic ones, these are kind of manufactured. The one all the way on the right, all the way right here. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, but uh that's kind of a plastic bin you purchase them sometimes uh they're anywhere between like 50 to 150 dollars uh they work pretty good and again you kind of fill up slowly slowly layer right in there uh they work great um this one the kind of one with the screen that's just a circle i like that one because it's just super simple um not complex doesn't take much work um to do and then these other two uh they kind of have two bin systems i'll talk about why that's kind of uh, cool in a second, um, but it's good to kind of have one active compost uh, bin and then one that's just like finishing and waiting and slowly breaking down. So one that you're adding to and you're continuing to put uh, fresh material in and one that you're just letting rest and kind of break down and uh, get rid of everything. So sometimes it's nice to have two side by side. Uh, the one that's all the way at the bottom that's plastic, that's kind of a tumbler compost. And so the idea is um, instead of having to get in there with a pitchfork and like flip it every once in a while, uh, those ones that are kind of right on an axle, you can just spin them and uh, that'll turn it, mix it all up, uh, get some fresh aeration in there. Um, it's kind of a, a clever way of doing it. If you want, if you like that idea, if you like, hey, I don't want to use a pitchfork, I just want to spin it. Um, a cheap way to do that is to use one of these blue barrels, almost like a rain barrel kind of thing, right? but without the hardware of a rain barrel, putting a lid on it, drilling a few holes in it. And then um, I've seen people just roll it right on the ground without the stand, just push it essentially and roll it to uh, turn their compost and get some fresh air in there. So um, these are the kind of couple different kinds of bins. Uh, the one at the top again is that two bin system, people build out of wood, that kind of thing. Um, the one piece I did want to say is um, that some of these are missing. Compost bins have to have lids. So they have to be covered on the top. That's a city ordinance. Um, so all these would either be some kind of green uh, to block you know, rodents uh, or something to keep, keep that uh, covered. 
So uh, you do want to try and cover all sides and not allow uh, rodents or pests to get in there. Um, one thing to note, uh, mice and rats can get in a hole the size of a dime. So picture a dime, it's pretty darn small. Um, so about quarter inch uh, hardware cloth is what's recommended. And that's what you kind of see on this one that's a circle is a hardware cloth. You don't want to use chicken wire. Chicken wire, the holes are way too big. So kind of hardware cloth is essential uh, if you're building your own compost bin. If you're buying your own one, these plastic ones, they probably got it all figured out for you. You don't got to worry about it. But if you're building your own, you really want to make sure uh, it's like totally screened in and uh, nothing can get at it easily. So uh, those are kind of the different designs. Uh, the next one we'll go is kind of once you have a compost bin, how do you get started? Um, and the first piece I got is kind of picking a good spot for where your compost bin is going to be. Uh, the city does have ordinances around these uh, pieces. So I put some of them right there. They're not allowed in your front yard. Uh, they want you to be at least 20 feet from your house or from a neighbor's house, something like that. So find a good spot in the yard a little bit far away from folks. Um, and then uh, one thing to note, if you put it by a tree or somewhere near a tree, uh, the tree roots are going to grow towards your compost pile just because um, they, you know, they love the nutrients. They're going to be trying to suck them right up and, uh, you know, get some of those nutrients too. And then uh, typical sizes, if you are building your compost bin and you're not, um, you're not getting this little, you know, one of the plastic ones, um, the biggest you can do is five feet by five feet by five feet, 125 cubic feet roughly. Um, most folks are not going to need a compost bin that, that is that big. Um, more standard size is like three feet by three feet by three feet. Um, but really, even that is pretty big for a home composter. It doesn't take much. It uh, doesn't take a really big pile to uh, consume a lot. And a lot of this stuff compacts, breaks down. So even if you have, you start out with a full compost bin in two or three weeks, it's going to be half the size or a quarter of the size. Um, so, you know, step one, once you have your compost bin, uh, you pick a good spot, pick a good spot for your pile, figure out where it's going to go. Um, and then the other piece I mentioned earlier is trying to get some of that brown material and having it on hand and ready um, for, you know, ready to go in a pile off to the side. So um, and then you kind of start layering, just like I said, uh, in the very bottom layer, you kind of want to put thicker stuff maybe a little bit of branches or some wood chips. They kind of got some thicker straw here in this picture. Um, but you want to try and put something that's going to allow air to really get in there um, all the way at the bottom, even after it's got all this weight on it. So you kind of start your bottom layer off and you kind of put your uh, first pieces on, your first bits of uh, brown. You can put your hay or your leaves or whatever you want to put. Um, and then you kind of start adding your green and you just put layer by layer, week by week as you go um, and again this is for the cold composting method if you're doing hot composting uh, then you're likely to just kind of fill this whole bin up all at once so hot composting would like already have all the materials maybe they got a connection to a local grocery store or a restaurant or something um, and you'd fill that whole bin up boom just like that in a day um, and it would start cooking right away so but for cold composting we're just adding, adding like one layer at a time over and over and over again. So, and then the last little, little secret tip I got in there for you is uh, inoculating your compost. Um, and this is like kind of adding yeast to bread or uh, things like that. Uh, so to kind of jumpstart your compost, it's great if you can take a small little shovel full of already existing compost. Maybe you've got a neighbor uh, who's got some finished stuff. Uh, maybe you got, uh, you know, a community garden where you could get a little bit of it. But I really recommend adding, adding a small amount of like already uh, compost that's kicked off, that's active, that's moving around. Um, it's going to already be jam-packed with those macro and microorganisms and bacteria that are going to kind of just be ready to eat once you feed them. So that's kind of one of my tips for uh, doing your compost pile when you start is um trying to inoculate it with a little bit of the little bit of the good stuff so uh that's starting your compost pile and again the one thing i really want to recommend is there's no 
uh, one right way to do composting. Uh, this is such a natural process. Um, it's really easy to get going. Um, so I really recommend, you know, don't be scared, don't be nervous. There's not a way to mess it up. Um, we'll get to the problem solving or the, uh, you know, general problem pieces in a minute. Um, but you don't need some master recipe or like getting all the perfect ingredients together. Um, it's very easy to start composting, especially once you have a bin that you like. Um, and I guess one more piece I want to mention about bins. Um, just go back to these. I did say they all have to have a lid. That's a requirement. Um, but one thing to know if you are building your compost bin is uh, having a removable door of some kind is a very important part of it. Or having somewhere where you can access it, kind of open it up, flip the compost, and then close it back up. Um, so, for example, on this one, uh, you know, they've got these different panels that are kind of looks like held together with um, just little hooks or hinges on the bottom. So it can just open right up. Uh, but you want to do something so you can open those doors up if you can. So, um, yep. And then, so maintaining your compost pile. Uh, this is pretty pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You continue to add layers, as I mentioned. Um, you do want to make sure that top layer is nice and covered with brown material. You don't have any food scraps that are open and uh, easy to get eaten on by like you know pests or rodents. So you want to make sure it's nice and covered with brown material. Uh, the other thing I forgot to put on this slide is uh, make sure your moisture level is good. A lot of people don't think, oh, maybe I need to add some water. Uh, but if your compost pile is really dry, um, it's not going to uh, break down as quickly. Um, so again, like I said earlier, it's that wet sponge where it's just like moist, but not soaking wet. Um, and oftentimes these materials like the wood chips and the, the brown materials are very dry and uh, they're not getting enough moisture. Um, so try and check in on, as you're looking at your compost, as you're adding to it, um, if it needs a little spray of water, uh, you know, see if you can give it that. Um, and on the, in the, uh, inversely, uh, if it's too wet, if it's too moist, it's like soppy, soggy, uh, you can kind of add some wood chips or some sawdust or some dry material to try and balance that out, so. Um, for, Cold composting, uh, one of the important things and something that most folks know about uh, is turning compost. It doesn't matter actually if it's cold or hot. Uh, you always want to turn the compost somehow. This helps mix the materials up so it's not just like a big old pocket of like eggshells or a big old pocket of coffee grounds. Turning the compost pile helps mix those layers up and changes it from like a lasagna uh, to more like, I don't know, chili or a, you know, a, uh, some kind of soup or puree. Um, so turning compost is important for that reason, helps mix the stuff up, but it's also important because it gets air into the bed um, and everything, all those macro and microorganisms, they need oxygen um, to break down. And sometimes they can just get compacted, 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 and um, they won't be able to get air. Uh, and then it's called anaerobic. And anaerobic just means without oxygen, uh, anaerobic has sometimes like a little bit of a funky smell to it, uh, like rotten eggs or things like that, or it's kind of like a phosphorus smell. Um, so trying to turn it before that happens can kind of help deal with uh, that kind of thing. So uh, for the folks that are doing like commercial composting, the ones that are doing like really big piles and hot composting, um, they're probably turning their piles with like large equipment, like tractors and things like that. Um, and they try and turn, if you're doing a hot compost, um, you want to even monitor it with a thermometer. They're putting the thermometer in, they're watching the temperature rise and then fall. When it's, once it starts to fall, they flip it. And that could be as frequent as every week. They could be turning their pile every week for a little bit, just when it first gets going. Um, but folks who are doing composting at home and doing cold composting, you really don't have to worry about flipping it that often. Um, when I was a kid growing up, uh, with my mom's doing composting, that's kind of how I learned about this. Uh, my mom had a compost pile. Um, I would flip the compost maybe twice a year. Um, some folks recommend doing it once a month. Um, flipping it is good, is pretty much always good for cold composting. You never really have to worry about, oh, should I flip it too much or am I flipping it too much? Am I turning it too much? It's always a good thing to kind of just stick a pitchfork in there, open it up a little bit, let it get some fresh air, let those materials mix up. So that's kind of the majority of maintaining your compost, continuing to add 
and then making sure it's kind of getting oxygen and you're kind of flipping it every once in a while. So uh, that's really all it takes. Doesn't take too much to maintain it. Um, and then finishing your compost. So some materials, uh, and depending on, you know, if it's hot, if it's cold, is it winter, is it summer? Um, they take different amounts of time to break down. Uh, some stuff is going to break down really quick in like six weeks, four weeks. Some stuff is going to take longer. Uh, for example, wood chips take much longer to break down than leaves or sawdust, uh, you know, because sawdust is kind of already has more surface area. It's already broken down a little bit. Um, the wood chips take a bit longer. Um, my general kind of rule of thumb for how long should I expect it to take is it takes about a year, in my opinion, to do cold composting. Um, so you kind of make a pile at the beginning of the year, uh, maintain it best you can all year long, and then kind of in the spring of the following year, you should have some nice uh, quality stuff that you can use in your garden. Um, even if you started right now in the fall, uh, you might be able to have some stuff ready, you know, come May next year, um, ready to go. Um, so one thing you have to do, uh, though, when you're finishing your compost is kind of allowing, allowing it to rest. So if you keep adding materials over and over and over again, um, right on top, and you keep mixing them up, mixing them up, mixing them up, you've got materials in different stages of decomposition. Um, so the, there's nothing wrong with that, but um, you have to wait as long as the last material you added. So, you know, if you've been composting for, you know, a year, this you got a whole, you know, 10 gallons of compost that you've been breaking down for a year, but then you add some fresh, fresh veggie scraps, scraps to it. Now you got to wait, you know, a whole nother six months to a year before you can use that stuff. So one of the ways people deal with that is kind of the two bin method. Um, that's what I've got listed here. That's where they'll have one active and one resting pile. So there'll be one pile where they continue to add materials. And then after a while, they'll say, okay, this one's all done. Now I'm gonna let it rest. They'll let it rest for a few more months and start adding to the other pile. That's kind of what I was talking about initially when I showed you the different bins. Um, if you don't have two compost bins, no big deal. Um, one other way people deal with that is kind of this adding on top. Um, and that's where you kind of just keep adding on top, keep adding on top. And then when you're ready to get the good stuff, you kind of scoop the top layer off, put that off to the side somewhere else, take out your good finished compost, and um, then you kind of put that uh, other material right back in and get it going. Um, so either way, you kind of just have to at a certain point say to yourself, okay, I'm going to separate my good finished compost from my like fresh veggie scraps. Um, so, and then... I put sifting on here as well. Um, sometimes there's stuff that just takes too long to break down, uh, like wood chips, but there's still really good soil in there. Um, so like you can use that hardware cloth and just a screen and kind of shake it by hand and you'll get really thin, really fertile stuff like this picture right here. And it'll take out all the bigger, larger pieces. Um, some stuff takes longer to break down too, like eggshells. Um, sometimes you'll see little pieces of eggshell in your finished compost. That's not really a big issue. Um, if it's large stuff, like if you're seeing like, uh, you know, a tomato that's not finished composting or a little piece of banana peel, that's not ready. That needs to take a little bit more time um, to break down. You shouldn't have fresh raw material in your compost. Um, and so how do you know when it's ready? That's one piece is I was mentioning that all the materials broken down. Another part is it looks, it feels, it smells like soil. Um, it doesn't look like uh, decomposing material, that kind of thing. It's brown, it's dark, it's crumbly. Uh, it's called, some people call it aggregates. That's like these little kind of particles, um, little kind of, I don't know how to describe them, but uh, they're little nuggets essentially. They're all throughout the soil, very small, um, but it's kind of part of that soil structure. And then uh, one way, if you're really unsure, you're like, ah, I think it's, I think everything's broken down, but I'm not quite sure. Um, folks call it the bag method where they kind of just, you take a plastic bag, you take your compost that you think is finished, you put it in the plastic bag, tie it up or seal it up and uh, just let it sit for uh, you know a day or two and then open up the plastic bag uh, and smell it. <laughs> if it smells at all like it's still rotting or there's that little bit of rancid smell, your compost isn't ready. 
if that bag though smells like earthy and kind of smells like soil then you know your pile is good and finished and we're ready to go so that's kind of how to know when it's ready and again you kind of have to let your compost rest a little bit um at some point so um so the common problems that uh, folks run into, uh, I got three of them right on here. One of them is odor, my compost pile smells, things like that. Um, in my opinion, that's usually because there's like too much food scraps and not enough brown material. Um, and so kind of making sure, like I showed in that initial pile, making sure your food scraps are totally covered with the brown material and you're using a nice like of that 70-30 ratio. Uh, that's the one solution. And then the other piece, sometimes I mentioned earlier, if the pile is like way too compacted, way too moist, um, then air can't get in there. And that's kind of that um, rotten egg smell. It smells like phosphorus a little bit. Um, and that's a pile that's either too moist or needs to get turned and flipped a little more frequently too. So that's the main one there. Pests and rodents. Um, to me, the biggest thing is your compost pile on that one. Uh, if you got, you know, it totally screened off, if you've got it, uh, a lid on it, and then also if you're like covering up those food scraps, it's going to be a lot harder for the flies and for the rodents to get at. Um, so really making sure, uh, you know, you got totally screened off, you got a lid on it, and then as you add food scraps, they're covered up. So and then another problem folks run into or people ask me about sometimes is composting in the winter. Um, I usually say I recommend composting in the winter. I've always kept going uh, with the home backyard pile, even in the winter. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple tricks, tips and tricks you can add. You can add a little bit of hot water when you add the food scraps. Um, you can keep that brown material like inside your house a little bit um, so it stays warm too. That's the stuff like some sawdust or, you know, a little five gallon bucket full of wood chips or something. And you can add them together. Again, you do want to still layer it and cover it really good. Otherwise, it'll attract animals and such. Um, and your, your compost is likely to freeze up if it's a small pile. That's just the reality of it. Um, and it's going to take a little bit longer to break down. Uh, but it'll it'll kick right back off where it started without missing a beat uh, once it warms up a little bit. Um, the other little tip I have for composting in the winter is uh, that's that brewer's mash. I try and get a little bit of brewer's mash, which is just like spent grain from uh, somebody that makes beer. Um, and I'll add that kind of once it starts getting cold. It's got a, a little bit of a, some sugars and uh, it's a little bit of a nitrogen kick helps heat up your compost pile in the winter. So, so that's the uh, common problems that uh, folks have. Um, again, once you have finished compost, um, you can do a lot with it. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning all the benefits of compost. Um, you can add it to your garden. Uh, you can kind of sprinkle it kind of on top of a uh, potted plants and add just a little bit in there. Um, you know, it's uh, just very good to kind of mix in with your garden. Um, and then I kind of have one more little piece, um, which is compost teas. This is something else cool you can do once you have finished compost. Um, this is kind of like the next level uh, beyond just adding compost to a garden bed. Um, you can also brew tea with it, essentially. And now this is not for drinking. This is not like a health supplement. Um, this is like a, a, a nutrient uh, amendment for soil. Um, and it's really simple to do. Um, people have all sorts of complex compost tea recipes with amendments and all kinds of things in that. Um, but the easiest way to do it, you just take a sock or a cloth bag, if you're fancy, or a pantyhoe or something like that. Um, and you fill it up with some finished compost, some of your, your good stuff that's fully broken down. Um, and then you brew it. And what this does is essentially all the nutrients, all the micro and macro organisms that are in that uh, soil, they just multiply like crazy in the water if you do it right. Um, so that's kind of what they're doing. There's the brew versus steeping. So if you kind of look at the picture I've got, this one, they've got a little bit of like an air bubbler in there. Um, and that's like adding in oxygen just constantly uh, to the water and that helps the microorganisms uh, flourish a little bit more and the bacteria flourish a little bit more but you don't have to necessarily do that there are methods that involve just steeping it just letting it sit in water um, and that also works too good too um, and these teas you can kind of water them and give your plants a little bit of a boost uh, all throughout the year if you don't have your compost quite ready you just got a little bit of compost but you don't got enough to like spread it all across your garden um, this is a great way to uh, make some uh, 
a little bit of fertilizer. And then I put a little piece at the end, uh, comfrey compost tea. If you just remember that, comfrey compost tea, um, that is like a really easy way. If anybody's familiar with the comfrey plant, uh, you pretty much just take that plant, cut it up, put it in a bucket of water, forget about it for like three, four weeks. Um, and then it becomes a really nice fertilizer that you can add onto your plants or onto your garden beds, or you can add it right onto your compost pile. Um, and it adds some nitrogen to your compost pile too. So um, yeah, those are compost seeds. That's just another interesting thing you can do with compost. Um, I do have just kind of two other uh, fun composting methods. Um, I'm just going to touch on these lightly. If folks have more questions about them, I'm happy to answer, but I am running out of time a little bit, so I want to save some time for questions. Um, but vermicomposting. So this is a little bit different than the cold composting method or things like that. This is really using a lot of worms um, to eat up, eat up all your veggies. Uh, worms eat my garbage. That's the name of a book and one of the guides for how to uh, how to take care of worms. Um, but these are kind of the blue totes. These are just simple stuff that folks use. They kind of have even just one of them um, somewhere in the basement or in the garage or something like that. Um, again, you want to have a nice little balance between um, your uh, brown and green materials. And then the other thing to note is that uh, worms want really small, broken down material uh you can't really just add like a wood chip is going to take a while for a worm to get through uh they'd much prefer sawdust or leaves or something like that and um cool things about worms worms can eat their weight a day so imagine if you know you could eat your weight in a day it's like you know i'd be eating like 150 pounds or whatever a day that's insane um, so you get a pound of worms in ideal conditions. A pound of worms can eat like a pound of veggie scraps a day if they're nice and warm and it's easy for them to get at the veggies and those kinds of things. Um, worms also kill bacteria uh, with the slime that's on them. Uh, bacteria like E. coli, salmonella, stuff like that. Just by even rubbing against it, they kill it and they kill it when it digests kind of through their gut. Um, so worms are really fascinating. Uh, creatures, uh, they multiply very quickly, um, and it's pretty easy to kind of do a small worm bin at home. I, I kind of put that bottom layer in the worm bin with kind of heavy brown material. Uh, that's where I'd put the, maybe the wood chips and such, um, and then I kind of start my layering up from there in a similar fashion. So that's vermicomposting. That's another cool way to compost. Um, and then one other one I threw in there. I'm not quite as familiar with this one, but I wanted to include it because it's pretty darn cool. And that is Bokashi composting. And this is kind of a, I don't know if it's fancier, but um, it's a little bit more uh, accelerated. Um, and, and it's kind of the opposite of regular composting. Regular composting, you're trying to get air in there and kind of flipping it and turning it and that kind of thing. Uh, Bokashi composting is anaerobic, which means it does it without oxygen. And it's also kind of like a fermentation process. Um, and so essentially, you mix in your veggie scraps um, with this Bokashi bacteria and this stuff like ferments it and just like chews through it super quick. It's got a way faster turnaround time. Um, they're even suggesting they can take some stuff like meats and dairies and such. Um, and it takes a really small amount of space. Um, so it's just one kind of interesting method. If you're interested, look into it a bit more. Um, there's a lot of information out there, but I want to just kind of throw it out there for people to think about too. So, um, and then the last piece I got, uh, there are a ton of other organizations out there doing compost uh, uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, you know, Groundwork Milwaukee, we set up compost bins at our community garden sites and try and assist gardeners, community gardeners in building their own soil health. Um, but there's a bunch of other organizations, Compost Kids, they're an all volunteer run nonprofit. Uh, they focus on compost education. And they also set up community compost sites. So if you can't compost at home, you can't compost in your backyard, you can likely compost at one of their community sites. So check them out. Uh, compost Crusaders, they're an awesome organization. Um, they do a lot of uh, compost pickups from your house. So again, if you don't want to compost at home, but you want like a compost bin, like similar to your recycling bin at your house, that's something they can provide for a fee. So they're really cool. Um, and then, KGMB or Keep Greater Milwaukee Beautiful. Uh, they also have composting resources. 
Um, they also sometimes will run a sale with the city of Milwaukee, selling compost bins for really cheap. It's usually in the spring, um, so you can check them out. Uh, they have information not just about composting, but about kind of recycling and all kinds of different uh, environmental pieces. And then if you're wondering who the big guys are in Wisconsin for, and you know, some of the biggest composters, uh, that's Blue Ribbon Organics and Purple Cow Organics. Um, Blue Ribbon is the one we generally go for if we're building a new garden bed and we're trying to get like a lot of compost, like truckloads of compost. We call it Blue Ribbon. They help us out. So uh, that's pretty much the presentation I got. Uh, Going to open up the last couple minutes we have for questions and uh, appreciate everybody attending. Hey, thank you so much, Nick. Um, so yeah. If you are in the audience and you have some questions, feel free to go ahead and enter those into the question box. Um, there was a question that came through a bit earlier asking whether the presentation will be shared with attendees. And mm -hmm. yes, so we did record this and tomorrow everyone should receive a link um, to view that recording. Um, and I actually I do see a question that just came in uh, for Nick. If you have worms I'm sorry, if you use worms for composting, how do you separate them out when you eventually want to use the compost in the garden or on plants? Great question, great question. Um, so what I generally do is make a little worm trap. So I'll put like a very small screen at the very top of the compost and one, I'll also let them finish. So uh, try and letting them consume all the material that's in the worm bed or in the compost pile, right? not adding things for like two weeks or so. And then I'll put this little trap, as, as I call it, where it's really just a screen at the top with a bunch of goodies, a bunch of stuff they really like. So like banana peels or already broken down stuff. So after they've been, you know, not able to find any good food for a week or two because you've been getting, letting it rest, then you put this little trap on the top with a screen on it, um, big enough for them to go climb through about quarter inch. Um, with all the goodies and all the food in it, and they'll just climb right up through there generally uh, and start eating that fresh food. And you can kind of take that screen off and uh, start right on the next one. So that's what I'd recommend. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question for Nick. Do you have any feedback on a commercial compost starter additive that can be purchased at the home store? I do not have a, a feedback for a commercial additive. Um, I kind of, you know, I was hinting at the inoculation and taking like some stuff from an older compost pile and putting it in there. Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm not familiar with the products that are out there at Home Depot and things like that. Um, I've kind of always just used the old school kind of uh, taking taking some from an already existing pile. Um, and again, I that. Um, Comfrey compost tea, that's a great one to kick off your compost pile. Just taking comfrey plants, putting them in a bucket with some water with the right proportions, letting it sit, and then watering your compost pile with it. That jump starts it with a bunch of nitrogen. Um, so that's another way I recommend. So. Okay. Um, actually, I don't see any other questions. Um, so, uh, Nick, thank you again. Um, did you want to share anything else while we have a couple minutes here? Um, I'll just I'll mention I I was uh, visiting the Groundwork Milwaukee website and I noticed this app that you have that um, is to kind of collect produce um, and redistribute it. I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit about that. I'd love to take a minute to tell you guys more about it. It's called Fresh Food Connect. It was actually started by uh, the Groundwork Trust that's in Denver, and we've just launched it this year in a couple zip codes. So this is our first year uh, trying it out, um, but it's really centered around this concept of gleaning and of taking excess produce that people have. Um, you grew, you know, you got a ton of tomatoes, you don't know what to do with all the tomatoes or whatever it is, any small amount. Um, you can kind of download this app and uh, kind of put in what you have and schedule a pickup from us. And our uh, our staff and our volunteers kind of come to your community garden or wherever you're at. Uh, we pick up what you guys have harvested and what you have extra, and then we take it to a local food bank um, that's in your neighborhood. Um, and so we really believe in uh, providing healthy, quality food uh, to all residents of Milwaukee. 
Um, and sadly, all residents of Milwaukee do not have access to quality food. So this is kind of just an app we just recently launched uh, trying to address that. Um, another kind of piece similar to that, but uh, not quite with the app. We're also doing uh, relaunching some of our gleaning programs this summer or this fall in particular. And that's going to places like uh, folks who have an apple tree in their backyard and they just got way too many apples or uh, a farm that has already harvested all the produce that they're gonna sell at market, but there's still a ton of stuff right there at the farm. We're organizing volunteers uh, to go out, glean those, glean that food and then get it to local food banks. So thank you for uh, giving me a sec to talk a little bit about that stuff. No, oh, thank you. And for everyone in the in the group, I did uh, place the link to the Fresh Food Connect information in the chat box. So definitely check that out. I think that's such a wonderful service that Groundwork Milwaukee is providing for our community. And, you know, I didn't see any other questions. So I want to thank you for this really comprehensive intro into composting. Um, and I and I hope uh, we had some folks here who are, who are excited to get started. Um, so thank you again, Nick, and thank you for everyone who joined us um, and just watch for that recording and we will be sure to send it out. Great. Thank you so much, Christina, for the opportunity. Yep. Thank you again. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.